Hello everyone and welcome. I hope the technology is working for you all. Please let us know in the chat box if there are any problems on your end. My name is Nick Toner and I'm a trustee of the Avni Park Trust. I'm standing in for our chair, Tom Walker, who I'm sure many of you know. He is away tonight on a well-deserved break. I live in Hackney, just down the road from the park, and I'm here to do a very quick introduction prior to the talk. So thank you all for signing up. And thanks also to Zach and the team for your work in getting this show on the road tonight. We're delighted that you've all joined us here today and we'd like to extend a special thanks to all of you who have made donations as part of the ticket reservation process. We're really grateful for that. And I'm also pleased to see that we've got people from all around the world here represented tonight. I can see that we've got people logging on from Germany and Tennessee and also all across the UK as well, which is really wonderful to see. Here at the Avenue Park Trust, we're a registered charity. We work alongside the London Borough of Hackney, which maintains the park, but we are Avenue's custodians. We're here to promote the park's unique history, safeguarded status as a designated nature reserve, and also its role as a public space. We're archive managers, we offer grave searches, and we also work to make sure that the park is welcoming to every local resident, no matter their background or their community. And we as trustees are very proud of this magical urban woodland, as we like to call it. And we're proud of the way that it's remained open, welcoming and safe during the pandemic. I'm sure that all of us here tonight who are local to the park and who visit it regularly would agree. Earlier this summer, we were especially proud to see that the park hit the headlines thanks to a Financial Times journalist who wrote in the paper that she found it reassuring to see daily life taking place among these monuments to the past. So if you've not been to the park recently, I'd highly recommend that you give it a visit when you can and experience this profound feeling of reassurance for yourself. Now, over the last few months, we've obviously all had to adapt to the coronavirus and Abney Park Trust is no exception. But I'm pleased to report that we've held a number of successful virtual events so far. Back in May, for example, we enjoyed talks from Alan Gartrell and Sam Perrin for our 180th anniversary. Those talks were on the topics of Abney's formation and also its relationship to the suffrage movement. And we were really pleased to get some excellent feedback from those. But it does remain the case that our main forms of fundraising, like in-person events, are on hold. So far, we've raised £12,662 via our online appeal. And that amount is rising all the time, including tonight. These donations are essential for ensuring that our operations can continue for ensuring that we can carry on restoring monuments, for example, and for ensuring that we can invest in great staff to facilitate events like this one tonight. So if you haven't yet donated this evening, I ask you please head to our website, abneypark.org, and hit donate at the top and spare whatever you can. But now onto the main event. We're delighted to have Dr. Romany Reagan with us tonight. Dr. Reagan's PhD is in performing heritage at Royal Holloway. She's been associated with Abney for several years, her research project, entitled Abney Rambles, is a set of audio walks about the park, and they form important parts of Abney's digital footprint. They're much loved by users of the park, and I'd really recommend listening if you haven't already. So you can see why we're excited to have Dr. Reagan here with us tonight. Tonight, of course, we're gathering thanks to the power of digital and the internet, and the internet certainly has helped the Trust survive this challenging period. But this period is, of course, a tiny footnote in Abney's long history. Abney, as we know, began life as a Victorian garden cemetery, a type of place known for its solemnity. But as the decades have elapsed, attitudes to this unique place and to cemeteries generally have changed. Personally, in the years that I've been visiting Abney, I've heard it described in so many varying ways. Peaceful, magical, dark, regenerative, moving, and several more. And what this shows is that the cemetery means and has meant different things to different people in different eras. And to us at the Trust, that really is something to celebrate. And tonight, Dr. Reagan will be taking us on a journey through the historical context of these changing attitudes, exploring the fascinating world of mortality mediation, as it is known, plus dark tourism and much more. So we're glad to have Dr. Reagan with us and hear what she has to say. So without further ado, over to her.
My name is Romani Reagan, and I recently received my practice-based PhD in performing heritage, which sits within the wider field of creative public engagement. And to offer you a little background about why I'm speaking with you today, I, for my PhD project, I researched, wrote, and recorded for audio walks through Abney Park Cemetery between the years of 2014 and 2017, exploring the different layers of heritage I discovered on site. And those audio walks are also available for free to take on the Abney Park website. So over the six years that I spent um, with Abney Park Cemetery as my site of research, I also was studying Victorian Garden Cemeteries in general. And the aspect of that research that's useful to our conversation today is how these historic places of mourning fit within our communities now. And so, okay, so throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about the development of Victorian Garden Cemeteries, the movement behind this beautification of death, and how these Victorian efforts are still helping us today by way of offering places for secular mortality mediation. And so what that basically means is cemeteries offer spaces for us to confront our, confront our own death, but also the death of those we love from a peaceful remove. So where does the dancing come in? I hear you ask. Well, mortality mediation is a two-part process. First, you contemplate death and you celebrate life. So to begin, why do people visit cemeteries? The motivations for visiting a cemetery are varied, and there are probably quite a few people joining us today who have gone to a cemetery for other reasons other than visiting a grave. Motivations vary between visitors, obviously, but they can also vary between cemeteries themselves. Cemeteries can mean different things to local communities, and they also vary widely with regards to where they sit within the wider community context. There are many ways to visit, there are many reasons to visit a cemetery other than to pay respect to a dead loved one. And surveying the different types of visit and visitor are helpful when discussing what cemeteries mean to us today. When we analyze the demographics of why people visit them, it helps us look at what cemeteries mean as community spaces. And another way to help us do that is to look at a couple theories behind, behind cemetery visits in general. One theory that you actually might have heard of before is this concept called dark tourism, which was made popular by the Netflix TV show by the same name, Dark Tourist. Dark tourism is a relatively new category, and it's developed out of a much older practice known as thanatourism. Thana comes from the Greek word thanatos, which means death. So from a cursory look, thanatourism is just essentially death tourism, but it's much more than that. Studying dark tourism as a specific area of practice began in the 1990s, and during the past 30 years of that study, the term dark tourism and thanatourism have been used interchangeably. However, there are some key differences between these two practices I'd like to highlight. Dark tourism is a hugely diverse area, and it's basically an umbrella term that can describe any kind of tourism that's related to death, suffering, atrocity, or crime. The tourist sites that are usually labeled under dark tourism are usually those from events that happened in the 20th century. Thanatourism, on the other hand, is more focused, and it comes from a long heritage of travel or visits that are motivated by a specific desire for an encounter with death. The long history of thanatourism is, mo is motivated by thoughts of memento mori, much more than any sort of contemporary thrill-seeking dark tourism activity. While a recent spike in the visibility of dark tourism can be seen, dark tourism is largely regarded as a contemporary phenomenon, where thanatourism has a much longer historical lineage. Cemeteries are sites of grief and past pain. However, all of the deaths that represented there happened elsewhere. A cemetery is a site of death, but it's not a site of terror. The dead within a cemetery are not there to do to anything horrific that happened within its cemetery walls. And as such, a visit to a cemetery would fall under gray tourism rather than the darkest tourism. Visiting places associated with death enables people to encounter and negotiate death in situations that don't involve terror or dread. It presents settings for us to satisfy our curiosity and fascination about death and confront the inevitability of our own death through gazing at the death of others. Thanatourism, then, is a number of contemporary practices that mediate between or connect the living and the dead. Visits to sites of burial have long been framed as places for this type of contemplation. And also the Arcadian setting of these garden cemeteries softens thoughts of mortality by putting, on, putting forth this image of a good romantic death. And this softening effect is what we call mortality mediation. Many researchers have found that interest in visiting sites of death and suffering has increased in recent decades. However, this appears to be more of a sensationalist engagement with recent sites of tragedy, 
and its accompanying poor taste selfies in our social media age. However, this form of dark tourism bears little to no resemblance to the motivations that drive thanatourism. And this is not to say that dark tourism is a bad thing. We all have a basic human drive to connect with atrocity to better understand our own fears. Some theorists have observed that we're now entering an age that's beyond just death denial into actually a death deriding age, where death is mocked, commercialized, and sold for the sake of art or entertainment. This death deriding age manifests in some of our more criticized forms of dark tourism practices, those of commercializing the sites of suffering. And the resulting seeming callousness of visitors to such sites comes from the appearance of visitors not empathizing with these sites of actually real places of suffering. They're instead focusing on just the fame of a catastrophe, such as bus tours and selfie stops through the radioactive ghost town surrounding Fukushima, which were featured on an episode of Dark Tourist. However, despite some recent extreme examples of dark tourism, mediations between visitors and death have been happening in a variety of contexts throughout history. They've just been shifting between modes of experience. It can be easy to lump together people who enjoy hanging out in cemeteries with poor taste selfies in disaster areas, but desiring an encounter with death was not invented with a smartphone. Depictions of death and dying in romantic art and literature provided a thanatopic mediation of death. These paintings and books recreated death and the dead through art for evaluation and contemplation by the living. The link with the romantics and death contemplation manifests straight through to today. In fact, just a few years ago, I actually went to this room. It's where Chatterton overdosed on opiates. It's at um, St. Mary's in Bristol. In this room, you can visit today. Tourism of the late 18th and 19th century reflected the contemplated aspects of mortality mediation and involved trips to sites of death that were depicted by the Romantic movement in their paintings and poetry. The Romantic period of painting and literature in the late 18th century grew into the subgenre of Gothic literature and sublime painting in the 19th century. These encounters with death themes that were represented in the Romantic movement were precursors and inspiration for the development of Victorian garden cemeteries. This aesthetic in art progressed into the real world in the form of landscape and garden planning. And this was in the theme of an Arcadia, in other words, a utopia. These brought funerary thoughts and memorial into the garden. And this, of course, had a direct knock-on effect of bringing the garden utopic Arcadia aesthetic into the graveyard. These graveyards were previously cramped in odiferous places, and they wanted to instead to create a pleasant environment for mourning and reflection. A memorial in a garden would not only evoke memories of the departed within a comfortable and pleasing setting, but I, these ideas of Arcadia as well. Most importantly, all references to the horrors of decay, of decomposition in a dank, unwholesome graveyard were swept away. Graves in beautiful landscapes surrounded by honeysuckle, willows, and creeping ivies. These are places where living could linger over picnics. And they can remember their dead in a way that almost seemed to suggest their continued presence. Here was the peaceful, beautiful ideal, a place fit for reflection and memories, a place where death was civilized. Images of the tomb were brought into the garden and the garden was brought into the tomb and this garden cemetery was born. Garden cemeteries were designed with paths for walking, gardens with pretty views and benches for visitors to stay for a time. They were created not merely to be looked at but also as places to spend the day. A family day out to have a stroll through the graves wasn't considered morbid, it was a way to show love for lost loved ones or just enjoy the gardens. And the main difference between early 19th century church graveyards and the later garden cemeteries is that enjoyment of these gardens was not relegated to only mourners. The Victorian impulse to visit the dead and keep them alive with family outings to landscape parks speaks to a desire for beauty and reverence in relation to the dead that's a recurring theme throughout all practices of Victorian mourning. Beautiful monuments erected by the upper and middle classes to display their wealth may also added to the family, also added to the family day out and experiencing this find of beauty. The locations of the garden cemeteries place them within a short journey of the city center. And so the garden cemeteries would become destinations for respectable weekend outings. And in fact, these cemeteries were one of the very few places where widows and single ladies could go unaccompanied by a chaperone. And so you might even have marriage possibilities amongst the stones. Victorian garden cemeteries exemplified the time and space people gave during this era for grieving and honoring their dead. However, the place these garden cemeteries had within Victorian culture 
and the perspective in their daily life shifted dramatically as we enter the 20th century. Attitudes throughout the 20th century began a massive pendulum shift away from death acceptance into death denial. This was brought about by a few factors, not the least of which was that these previously embodied practices of dealing with our dead and dying ended and changed. Instead of caring for dying loved ones and preparing the body for burial by the family, professionals began to take over not only end of life care, but also corpse care. And grief after death became something increasingly that was shushed away and something that was to be kept private. Dying people lost their status and agency and became increasingly sequestered away from society like a dirty secret. Death discussions became a new taboo. Instead of regarding this as a natural process of life, and through our foreignization of death, we increased our fear of death, not lessened it. One of the audio walks that I wrote as part of my PhD project on the heritage of Abney Park called Thoughts on Mourning addresses difficult death themes in the space of the garden cemetery that emphasizes the Victorian approach to this fear of death by creating a peaceful space for remembrance through the longevity of stone and the beauty of gardens. With the fracturing of societies that we have today, many of these mourning gardens no longer offer the same aspect of communal grief that they once did. Cemeteries and other physical memorial spaces, they serve a vital role in bereavement. However, the communities who use them are dispersing and burial as a form of body disposal itself is also falling out of fashion. Our garden cemeteries must adapt to serve as thriving community spaces if they're to remain relevant and survive. And offering a space for a family day out is exactly what they were designed to do with such care in the first place. To bring some context to why changing burial practices was necessary, it's important to understand what burial was like in the beginning of the 19th century. So the Industrial Revolution brought about many changes into how people lived, but the most impactful change was this surge in people moving to urban areas. By 1850, the population of London had doubled from what it was at the beginning of the century, and sanitation and burial, as you can imagine, quickly became a problem. Small city churchyards were quickly filled to overflowing. Overcrowded churchyards led to doubling up of grave use, and this resulted in shallow graves, which then were corpses could be pushed to the surface. Um, there would be shifting earth, which would then invite animal in interference. And this contributed to abhorrent smells and also contamination of local water. So this engraving from a famous scene in Charles Dickens' Bleak House is when Lady Dedlock searches for the grave of her dead fiance. And she's horrified to discover that his body lies in such an overflowing and putrid churchyard. Between the visible body parts and horrible stenches, these graveyards were awful to even walk past, let alone envision burying your loved one there or spending any time by their graveside. So the idea to fix the situation was to create more burial space, more burial space and to do so outside of London. And in 1832, Parliament passed a bill encouraging the establishment of private cemeteries outside of these urban centers, and the Victorian Garden Cemetery was finally underway. Which brings me back to the ideas that I presented at the beginning of this talk. This concept of cemetery spaces offering opportunities for mortality mediation. And ever since their founding in the mid 19th century, the contemplative space these cemeteries offer fulfills a long standing desire for encounters with death. And it's because of this quality that cemeteries are key sites for thanatouristic practice and research. During the summer of 2010, cemetery researcher Rachel Rain interviewed visitors to three, I'm sorry, three British burial grounds for her 2013 paper, Bunhill Fields in London, Weiss Cemetery in Salford, and St. Margaret's Graveyard in Whitby. Visitors were interviewed to discover their motives for visiting these cemeteries, with the aim of formulating a typography of tourists who engage with these sites from the data that was collected. Rain divided cemetery visitors she interviewed for her research into four categories, beginning with the darkest and the most reverent and engaged with the sites of burial to the lightest and the least engaged with the space. Devotion visitors are those who are most specific to that particular cemetery, whether they are mourning a visiting, mourners visiting a dead loved one or a pilgrim experiencing the power of the place of the cemetery in a different way. These visitors are not just visiting any cemetery, they're visiting this cemetery. The next category down, experienced visitors, they come to cemeteries to confront and experience death. These are what we call the mortality mediation thanatourists, those who come for memento mori. Then discover visitors, these are the ones who come to the local cemetery to discover history. They are using the cemetery as an outdoor archive 
and a repository of stories and local lore. They engage with the cemetery space, but from a remove of historical analysis. And the last group, which are called incidental visitors, these are the passive recreationists. They are the lightest category of all because they don't engage with the cemetery in any site-specific way. They use it purely as a park to enjoy. These visitors engage with cemeteries as peaceful gardens, community spaces, and they almost seem to ignore the burial aspect of the cemetery space. Incidental visitors were the most significant demographic in Rain's study, and they made up the largest number of people that she interviewed and observed. Rain found that the incidental category had not been identified by previous literature on dark tourism, despite this category being the most common demographic she came across. Rain's findings are in keeping with the Abney Park Trust Youth Survey, which was conducted by Hackney Council in 2017. When asked to the purpose of their visit to Abney Park, 73% of respondents to the survey came to go for a walk, with a further 16% coming to walk the dog bringing the total percentage of visitors coming to Abney Park to take a walk to 89%. There was a smattering of small large percentages comprising exploring history, exercise, a woodworking class, to see a play or to volunteer, but only 8% of visitors came to visit a grave. The survey highlights that while the cemetery may visually appear to be dominated by graves, its actual use by the community may illustrate a very different kind of relationship. Another interesting demographic polled um, in the survey was religious affiliations, or actually more interestingly, lack thereof. 65% of respondents ticked atheist or no religion, with only 16% identifying as Christian. 14% of visitors were of other beliefs, with secular beliefs making up 5%. The religious demographic breakdown of visitors to Avenue Park reflects, <clears throat> sorry, reflects its aspect as a community space with no primacy given to Christianity, nor actually to any religion at all. Even when it was founded, Abney Park was an unconsecrated, non-denominational cemetery. However, over time, there's been a secularization of all of our Victorian garden cemeteries. The current mixed use of cemetery space by the community is actually a natural progression of what these cemeteries were originally founded to achieve. One thing to remember is graveyards used to be central places of merriment for communities going back to the medieval times. Um, one archdeacon in Wales in the year 1188 wrote voluminous writings on whether or not laymen and women should be allowed to dance in churchyards and feast days. So this discussion we're having isn't even a new one. <laughs> Victorian garden cemeteries were developed during an era of limited public green space before the development of the prolific public parks we enjoy today. One thing to remember is Clissel Park, which is just down the road, wasn't founded until 50 years after Abney Park opened. So for the majority of the 19th century, Abney Park was the largest local park anyone could go to. And it's easy to forget, but Victorian urban density grew so fast that, and was much faster than community development plans, that when they, by the time they had developed green spaces, it was a good solid, you know, half a, half a century after the cemeteries. These cemeteries were offered as a way to fill that green space gap. And since green space was such a premium in urban environments, these new cemeteries were also gardens, arboretums, open spacious places of impressive sculpture. It was entirely different from these cramped parish churchyards that were, gone, that were gone to before. They were too full of bodies and no one would ever want to bury their loved ones there. But these new gardens were open and airy, but they were also outside of town. So they were not the local church where people already went to worship. So a visit to a garden cemetery would usually involve a separate trip. And that's the difference between a churchyard and a graveyard in a cemetery. Graveyards are attached to a church. Cemeteries are separate places, not attached to a church. And therefore, they are not religious spaces. These cemeteries became leisure space, a location for strolling along shaded paths and picnicking before the development of city parks allowed citizens to escape the noise and chaos in urban life. I mean, look at these guys. They've got sausages. Cemeteries provided a primary space available for enjoying the outdoors in an urban context. And that tradition continues today. Our cemeteries have not just recently evolved to become local community parks. They were always meant to be so. The findings of both the Abney Park Trust Youth Survey and Rachel Rain's interview research supports the view that many people desire to visit burial grounds for diverse reasons that are not related to active mourning. However, and this is important, this is not to say that cemeteries are exactly the same as a local park. 
Even if visitors have come just to walk the dog, there's a reason why they came to the cemetery to walk the dog. These spaces are special and they're different and that these burial sites not only offer contact with nature, but they also provide important places to contemplate on mortality, confront symbols of death in a pleasing and peaceful way. So the question comes to this, can we create a cemetery space that welcomes the community while also representing and respecting a heritage of mourning? Traveling across the pond to a very different kind of thanatourism experience, cemetery researcher Linda Levitt analyzed the current community use and responses to Hollywood Forever Cemetery located in Los Angeles, California in her 2012 study. A visit to Hollywood Forever is not the common cemetery experience that's offered by most historical burial grounds. And here the tension between solemnity versus celebration can be found in the expected mixed attitudes towards its mixed use. Both its location in Los Angeles and its deceased resident demographic consisting of movie stars and other figures of popular culture, Hollywood Forever is positioned as a tourist site as part of its actual reason for being. However, in addition to housing the remains of celebrities, the cemetery houses over 80,000 graves of other residents of Los Angeles, the vast majority of whom are not famous, and new burials are taking place up into the present day and beyond. Hollywood Forever is a working cemetery. So while it could be designated as a tourist site of more obvious description than most historic cemeteries, contemporary mourners are a defining visitor demographic in Hollywood Forever, whilst in most historic cemeteries, active mourners are more rare. So mourners and recreational visitors are together in this space. Hollywood Forever, Executive President Bill Albrook enjoys his cemetery's unusual reputation, as he told Levitt in one interview, Los Angeles Magazine declares us one of the 101 sexiest places in LA, and a lot of people do find cemeteries to be a little spooky, but it's also an extremely exciting and mysterious place, and it's a very sexy place. While the trustees of Ebony Park Cemetery work hard to make sure their reputation is pristine, Hollywood Forever appears to embrace a perception of a little bit of an alternative way of visiting. Although sexiness in this context suggests a reference to the overall aura of celebrity and glamour about the cemetery, not actual sex acts taking place on site, or it does, who knows. What a cemetery is considered, when a cemetery is considered exciting and romantic, this, as a location, this immediately raises questions about the uses of these spaces beyond the typical expectations of mourning and paying tribute to loved ones who are buried there. The stated motivations by Hollywood's forever managers for renovating and relaunching the cemetery after it fell into administration in the 1990s were not only to restore the cemetery itself, but they actually had the very bold aim of transforming the death care industry at large. They wanted to, quote, encourage a cemetery environment as celebrating life rather than mourning death. And as tools for encouraging this cultural shift, they invited use of their cemetery as leisure space. And this is where the seemingly divergent cultural spaces of Hollywood Forever and Britain's Victorian Garden cemeteries converge. The stated development goals of both types of cemetery are towards the promotion of the site as community space. There are some cemetery visitors who were against the idea of melting mourning and recreation. However, some of these members of the community might not be aware that visitors who enjoy cemeteries as a community space are actually reviving a practice that began with their founding over 180 years ago. However, despite this long history of cemeteries as mixed use community space, some detractors of mixed use still believe that cemeteries should be used for quiet mourning and reflection, and they're not receptive to other views of varied use within these cemeteries. These tensions can manifest into social media debates on views where people don't often see eye to eye. And one of the problems that I see with debating these issues on social media is the relative anonymity of the medium can lead people to be far angrier and more harsh than they would be in person. Without going into specifics, I myself have engaged in social media debates with differing points of view that have gotten rather heated at times, but I've always looked to approach someone who is upset with respect to why they might be feeling that way. Some of these social media conversations can be very fruitful and can spark meaningful debate, raising the issues around conflicting concerns and desires for what cemeteries should represent for their visitors. Many times, dislike of cemetery use as community space comes down to perceived disrespect. And there are many perceptions from visitors and mourners alike that run the spectrum from celebrating multi-use of cemetery space by the community to wishing it to be just a dedicated space of mourning. And these concerns come to the fore, especially sometimes in reference to, for example, Abney Park's chapel. And its original purpose was a mortuary chapel, 
these issues raise interesting questions about what defines reverence. For some people, a space of solemn reverence is important. And for some people, they think of their dead loved ones and they would like to think of them being surrounded by life and by laughter. And neither perspective is wrong. The problem comes when we try to think of whose voice will take primacy in these negotiations. These spontaneous social media discussions that can arise around events offer interesting insight into how community users to cemeteries feel with their varied mixed use. The feeling shared by detractors of the idea of holding events in cemetery space is usually based on, they think this type of use negates the cemetery as a place of memorial. And this is where I believe the conversation can move forward. It would be inappropriate to treat any cemetery as strictly a community park and to exclude entirely its space as a cemetery and as memorial. I think it's important for events teams to communicate effectively with their cemetery events calendars that negation of memorial is not the goal, but rather that mixed use works alongside memorial within a cemetery. The debate is not between for memorial and against memorial. Event space and memorial space are not mutually exclusive. Events that take place in Hollywood forever, however, do not merely use the backdrop of the cemetery as a community space, but engage directly with it as a cemetery, sometimes to challenge and even mock the community experience of Hollywood Forever as a memorial space. So for example, in 2001, the thrash metal band Slayer held a listening party for their album, God Hates Us All at Hollywood Forever. Slayer's lyrics are overtly and deliberately anti-Christian with their choice to hold their album listening party in a space of mourning, one of irony and overt mockery. And in 2007, the heavy metal band Korn began their family values tour with an after hours party in the cathedral mausoleum at Hollywood Forever. Using cemeteries as this kind of a social space raises a few questions. So first, if these are unconventional practices, what are the guidelines for appropriate behavior? How should tourists and visitors behave in the company of mourners? And who decides what constitutes respect for the living and the dead? And it can become quite a heated discussion within any space that deals with death, as there's a fine line between celebration and joy and then flat out irreverence. The issues of who creates the guidelines of appropriate behavior is a debate that many people working with any kind of community space will be familiar with. At Hollywood Forever, they also host an annual outdoor film festival where they screen films on the wall of their cathedral mausoleum. Debates around the use of the mausoleum for their film festival are similar around some of the debates about the use of Abney Park's chapel. Many people who feel comfortable with a presentation of play or a performance of classical music in a cemetery disapprove of a film festival. Showing films in the cemetery and projecting them on the mausoleum wall seems disrespectful towards the dead. And in some regard, this disapproval mask was essentially a highbrow, lowbrow critique, namely that high culture can find a place on cemetery grounds, but that pop culture cannot. And this is where lines of tension are drawn most starkly for community use of cemeteries. While a cemetery can be seen as a community space by visitors and even by some mourners, the lines of appropriate use are divided by quite subjective concepts about what is considered respectful, solemnity or celebration. Over time, shifting cultural attitudes have formed what is considered acceptable and unacceptable activities within cemetery space. Community use of cemeteries has evolved over many centuries and it's not remained a static relationship. Throughout the course of my research, I found that there's an inverse relationship between the time of a death and a tragedy and the darkness of a space. Visiting sites of tragedy that have taken place many centuries ago don't usually fall under the heading of dark tourism. For example, a visit to the Tower of London would not be considered dark tourism, it would just be considered tourism. Whereas a bus tour through Fukushima is considered very dark indeed. Following that line of reasoning, Victorian garden cemeteries, which are largely closed to new burial, fall under gray tourism sites and are usually more receptive to fluidity of community use within their walls. Hollywood Forever, however, is a working cemetery that hosts events, a few of which could be considered quite irreverent by the standards of even a very liberal-minded cemetery heritage manager. But visits to the cemetery are popular and people still choose to be buried there rather than elsewhere more quiet or obscure. No matter where members of the community fall on the scale or perception of darkness or lightness in their cemeteries or views of solemnity versus celebration within these burial sites, contemporary attitudes towards death and dying and our current cultural desire for a secular form of mortality mediation 
means mixed use of cemeteries as community space are likely to become more commonplace. As cemeteries today embrace a variety of perspectives and voices within their walls, and mixed use brings a sense of community relevance to what's arguably a dying mode of body disposal and grief, the transformation and perception of cemeteries from morbid and solemn to celebratory and inclusive will evolve as society's sensibilities towards death evolve, and cemeteries will undergo a cultural perception shift once again. And also there's a very nuts and bolts reality to consider too the expensive upkeep of cemetery space. Most cemeteries have no outside funding and are run by volunteers who help the underpaid staff. They have to raise money themselves. And even heritage lottery funding, which was given to Abney Park to stabilize the chapel, is strictly earmarked for renovation purposes. It's not a blank check. Events bring in much needed revenue to keep the gates open and the cemetery free for everyone. Events also keep interest in cemetery heritage alive. If a heritage site doesn't invite engagement with younger generations or address the increasing diversity of our neighborhoods, then heritage cemeteries will cease to be relevant for their communities. And short plug, if you're interested in doing a tour of Abney Park Cemetery as part of London Month of the Dead on Sunday, October 25th at 2 p.m., myself and my colleague Sam Perrin will be giving a guided tour, socially distanced, of course, through the cemetery. Back to the talk. <laughs> but one very large issue facing many of our heritage sites today, not just cemeteries, is this idea of continuing community relevance. The audiences for our heritage sites are aging out. As frequent surveys reveal, the age brackets and racial demographics for heritage visits are largely illustrating an older white audience. So what does that mean for a heritage site wishing to be a living community space for today and tomorrow? For our contemporary communities, which are a collection of diversity, people of color, LGBTQ, non-Western perspectives, and younger globalized identities. I love history and I don't wanna write over it. I don't, buy, I don't believe that by including more voices within our heritage stories, we have to overwrite any existing narratives. We should listen to each other and we should move forward with respect, but we must move forward. It's by the action of all heritage sites, including cemeteries, opening their gates to events, celebrating continuing change and life, that we're ensuring their community relevance for future generations. There isn't scope within this talk to delve, to delve into the seismic changing attitudes towards end of life care, the evolving green burial movement, or the death positive movement. But these are hugely transformative forces as well. It's a, it's a matter of evolve or perish. Even cemeteries can die. But before we die, please join us for some respectful, inclusive community fun in the cemetery. Thank you. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so we've got a couple questions coming through, um, one of which was just about um, the, the live tour information. And that is actually still being formulated. There isn't a link up to that yet because London Month of the Dead is still formulating their schedules. So when that's up, I will definitely be blasting it on um, social media through the Abney Park channel. And also, and if anyone wants to follow me on at Ms. Romney on Instagram, Twitter, also on email. So, um, yeah, I will, that's not going to be until the end of October. So, I'll definitely be up updating information. Um, so, other questions we got through was um, talking a little bit about how, how was it, the avenue was originally laid out. And so, what was interesting is, is at when they were first developed, these garden cemeteries were actually look utterly different than they are today. Obviously, being overgrown, you know, 180 years worth of growth that's changed over time 
over the 20th century, they went into administration. They were left increasingly not being able to be cared for. And even just when it comes to, so originally it was quite a very specific garden layout. So you would have, everything would be, you could see across. Like for example, Abney's 32 acres, you could actually see through it. It wasn't the overgrown aspect it has now. There was, um, there were 1200 kinds of rose books that were there. There was very much a more of a garden aspect and less of a wooded aspect. And when the funding for hand weeding all the graves, that's quite an expensive upkeep. And then when burials dropped out, there wasn't any more money coming in because that's the majority of the, the funding would have been come from burials. So you, instead of having hand weeders, you would have people go around and mowers and the mowers don't get between the graves. So the graves, you get your seedlings coming up and then they crack and topple the graves and then the trees come up through that and then they self seed and, you know, explodes from there. So it started from a lack of hand weeding that then obviously over the course of hundred years, you get what you have today. So I hope that answered that question. Um, let's see, sorry, let's see. Um, yes, our, so at least I can't speak for the rest of the garden cemeteries on when the dates of this, um, cause I know obviously, for example, Arnos Vale is still accepting burials today, especially in their green burial space. And Abney Park closed for new burial officially as in being plot sold in 1974. Um, the records were because of the fact that there was no one minding the store, there was a flood and there was water intrusion and there wasn't, so the records are not there. So even though we don't know exactly how many burials are out there, if some people are still buried there today because they have the documentation that, but these are all sites that were bought previous to 1974. So you can't purchase a plot today. So it's a bit, but it's a bit complicated, but yes, yeah, so there are still burials today, but not new sold burials. Um, Oh, yeah. Okay, this is excellent. So in the context of the recent Black Lives Matter protests and the longer movement of counter memorialization in the U.S., how can cemetery spaces engage with difficult histories? And this is something that I know that all heritage sites, especially um, museum, museum work, is looking to try to have more inclusive narratives. And especially some of these difficult histories, the history of sometimes silencing those histories within a heritage space, that can be something that's a little bit difficult for heritage managers to face themselves. And I know that we've been having um, chats, at least in the events committee, about um, how we can try to bring in these narrative voices, especially because of the large Afro-Caribbean community, not only in Hackney, but also the burials represented within Abney Park Cemetery. And there can be this perceived barrier to entry where people don't feel as a space for them, this, this concept of um, who is this heritage for? And what is this space for? And in that strive towards inclusivity, the, it's, it's almost a little bit flippant to talk about celebratory versus solemnity when there's a huge elephant in the room is the other, the other thing is who's this history for in the sense of demographics and people within the community not feeling included. And that's an incredibly important conversation that we are having and trying to, instead of having it be a top down, like we are gonna share these stories and find the community to come in and share their own stories and their own experiences. Um, so yeah, that's an important question. Uh, oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, da, 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 da. Let's see. Uh, do I have an opinion or observation when dark tourism stops becoming a healthy engagement with fear and becomes exploitive? Yes. Um, and I think it, it is. And that's why I tried to a little bit explain the difference between thunder tourism and dark tourism. I think that we have a human need to engage with the darkness because if you have to face your fears and it's also this idea almost of gallows humor, we need to be able to laugh at it or somehow reduce it down to entertainment. Um, look at, for example, um, London Dungeon, you know, it's this it's this disnified Disney, experience of horrific histories within London. And I mean, I've gone, it's fantastic, but you also need to re realize that these, these are actually horrible things that happened at the time. And I think that once again, it's that time between. So everyone does a tour of the Tower of London and, you know, you hear the horrible stories and the, the de decapitations and you thrill at it. And then you, you know, you, you go have a glass of wine and that's that. Whereas something that happened more recently, for example, of course, when I showed all the selfies outside Grenfell, that's considered abhorrent. And so when you think about it, what's the difference is the remove of time. And I think that when it comes to the concept of living memory, I think that's normally where the dividing, I know, for example, in pathology museums, your specimens that are on public display have to be older than 100 years old because that way that's the cutoff of what's considered within living memory and i think when you talk about when you talk about stories and you share them in a way that's not from your personal experience there really should be that sort of distance of beyond living memory otherwise maybe you should invite someone to share their own experience because i think a third party person sharing a story that they are not involved in that's dark tourism but a first first person account 
that's not dark tourism, that's sharing and working through problems. So I think it's also who is the one sharing the story. Is it a third part of your move looking down, you know, or is it a person sharing their experience? Um, how do I see summer trees changing in 2020? Um, I don't know what that means. Does that mean with the year or with the pandemic? I mean, with the pandemic, I would say that um, cemeteries are a great way to engage in social distancing and still have um, a day out because usually they're quite large spaces and it's a way to um, get away from your house yet also maintain social distancing. With regards to the sense that now we're moving in the you know firmly into the 21st century and um, most people scatter their ashes and they might have a memorial bench, a memorial stone somewhere that is either next to where they scatter the ashes or they might have a little note saying where they've scattered them. The idea of um, this sort of disembodied, the, the disembodied nature of grief is something that we're also facing that you don't have a, the sort of spatialization of grief has been lost. And that's something that I read I read a lot about during this. So this, the psychology of bereavement and how in the Victorian era, there was very much this, you have the, you have a double embodiment. So you have the embodied practice of taking care of the corpse itself and preparing it for burial, which is a very much embodied way of processing grief. And then after that, you have the stone, which is the physical representation of your lost loved one. And that is a very embodied way of memory. And now with the scattering of ashes um, and with the, the, the body itself being taken care of by professionals, you are losing that double embodiment. And so your grief can become, there's, there's a, a lack of there's a, you can't really touch the sides of it. It's amorphous. It's, it doesn't have a beginning, middle and end, and it can sometimes become unending due to that. Um, I think I will, yeah, I think that answered that question. Um, have there been attempts at dividing different kinds of use by time? For example, one day a week for mourners and people wishing to contemplate death, one or two days for families. That's actually fascinating. I've never heard that thought of before. I think that the only problem with that is that I think that it would be horrible as a, a grieving person to be dictated what day you can grieve. I think that would be really um, quite problematic. Um, I, I do. It's almost like I, I think where this question would come from is kind of this idea of um, there's like cinema days for families, which I think is brilliant. You know, if you want to take your children, it's a certain day. I think with cemeteries, it, it's not the cinema. It's very much a personal space. And I think people need to be able to encounter it when they're ready and how they're ready. So as much as that might kind of sound like an ideal way of sectioning people off, I don't think it would really work in practice. Um, how do you think the cemetery of the future will look? Will this conscious mixed use of space be considered? I think that in it sort of has to be in the sense that, once again, this nuts and bolts idea of funding. There isn't enough money. The burial, the burial fee is a one-off fee. There is not a constant sort of, you don't pay rent. So this idea of you're going to have a space and it's going to be yours and there will be nothing else happening but just mourning. That's just, it's just, it's not a tenable situation. You need to be able to have other streams of revenue. And I think that with more, as, as the demographics of the people who are mourning are getting into a more technologically advanced age demographic, like for example, I know John Troyer talks a lot about the future of cemeteries and the future of mourning and the digitization of our mourning process and the idea of having, and this goes beyond even just having, you know, mourning on Facebook pages. You'll have, um, you have you know QR codes on on gravestones, and you can have like the idea of these like holographics that come up, which I think would be kind of fun from like a heritage point of view, but maybe not from a contemporary um, mourning point of view. Um, and I do think yes, I mean I I think that how our communities engage with mourning is a constantly evolving conversation. But I do think that any sort of a mourning space would have to take in this kind of embedded non digitization and um, mixed communities kind of rubbing up against each other and within the same space. And yeah, that. I mean, if I, you anything designed going forward has to take that into account. Um, are you aware of any research that particularly asks how cemeteries support grief in those cemeteries with recent burials? Um, I think that what's interesting is that because my side of research is Abney Park, obviously I studied Victorian Garden cemeteries, but that was from the library. I didn't really do a lot of hands-on work with how other working cemeteries deal with their, their contemporary mourning population. I do think that a lot of the death cafe movement has been really helpful when it comes to processing um, people discussing grief. And I know that some cemeteries do hold death cafes on site. Um, obviously, death cafes have also been a bit problematic because a lot of people who run them are not um, trained bereavement counselors. And so you can kind of crack open a, a part of, of your mourning that then isn't packed away properly at the end of the event. So obviously, I know those are problematic. But I do think sometimes raising the question is as important as solving it properly because it's an ongoing process of how we're going to give people support because we don't have the community support we used to we used to have this really prescribed way that we grieved we would telegraph our grief 
via clothing and we'd have, you know, full morning, half morning, and then we would have this sort of routinized way we went through it. And now we're kind of left to our own devices in a lot of ways. And there isn't this strict community set path. And so people can get a bit lost in how they process that. And there are groups who talk about it mostly with, um, let's see, it was a University of Bath, what's it called? Um, the Center for Death and Center for Death and Society, I think CEDAS, yeah. Sorry, I can't think on the fly, but they do a lot of work researching um, what is what is death care now, palliative care, working with um, different communities and their voices. And so they're one to follow for up to date research on that. Um, yeah. So, OK, you say cemeteries can die. What is the process? What happens to the remains and memorials? Um, so, for example, um, I was having this I was talking about to on, in another conversation about if you go in, if you go in the center of London or probably any urban center, you'll have these green spaces that have stones stacked to the side. So I know um, Poston Park in London and also St. George's Gardens, the green space is there, but then along the walls, you'll see these sort of push to the side stones. And what they did was when they were trying to make green space in London, and of course, because a lot of these burials were once again, beyond the living memory mark, they would remove, they were supposed to remove the bodies and bury them outside town, but a lot of times they didn't do that either. Um, bodies still there, just stones moved to the side. And so they were creating the green space with the stones just kind of put over there. And that that's kind of what I mean about when you, if something isn't within living memory, if someone isn't there to tend the grave and leave the flowers and acknowledge the person, then what it becomes is just a heritage monument, like any other heritage monument. And it has to be dealt with in in a, in a very sort of, I don't want to say cold way, but it's, it's more of an analysis way. Like we have a monument, what do we do with it? There isn't an emotion attached to it from a mourning perspective. And as a cemetery ages out and as more people who remember that those people fall off, then you really are dealing with a pile of memorial that has to do with a heritage perspective. So yeah, that, that becomes problematic when you think how long do we freeze this particular way of being a cemetery and aspect do at what point on our history are we going to froze in time? And how does that serve a contemporary community today? If it's just this museum to the death of people that is no longer within community memory. So um, can you say what size Rachel Rain's 2013 sample was and over how many days was data collected? Likewise, Abney user, yes, the Abney user research survey was 349 people. I don't know the duration of time. Rain's, I don't remember. I, um, I, I, will, I wanna say it, it was it was 100 and something. That's from, that's from just my memory off the top of my head. I'm not sure, but I know, yeah, it was like 349, I think for the Hackney one. Um, yeah, cool. So that appears to be the end of questions. So thank you. Hopefully that was coherent enough. I just sort of, <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much for that, Dr. Regan. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for further questions. I'm sure some people might have more questions. And, and you can get in touch with Dr. Regan via Twitter. Um, and that's at, at Ms. Romany. So that's M-S-R-O-M-A-N-Y. Or if you prefer, you can email us on info at abneypark.org. Abney Park is all one word in our URL. And we will put in touch. And you can also email us on that address if you have any questions about the work of the trust. Perhaps what brought you here tonight was that you have a loved one buried in the cemetery. And if so, we can help with archive information, grave searches and so on. So again, do just let us know. Once again, before we leave, I must say events like these are absolutely essential for helping the trust to raise funds. And now more than ever, we need that help. And so for the last time tonight, I would please ask you to head over to the website and click on the donate button at the top in order to donate whatever you can to help keep the work of the trust alive. So we'll be putting the talk online afterwards once it's edited and please do send it around to anyone who you think might be interested. And just before we leave, very quick thank yous. First of all, to Dr. Reagan for a wonderful talk tonight and also for all your work for Abney in the past. You've done great work helping to preserve the heritage of the cemetery and also to help understand its history and shift in functions. And thanks especially to Dr. Reagan for giving up your time to be here tonight, this evening, free of charge. We really do appreciate that. And thanks to you to Zach and Hayden, our staff, who have worked hard behind the scenes to help ensure this event was a success. And thanks as always to the park keepers, managers, staff at Hackney Council who maintain the precious space.
Thanks again to the other trustees here at Abney who work tirelessly to promote the park's heritage and wildlife and to safeguard its future. And finally, thank you very much to all of you for coming and good night. <laughs>